it's just a computer service? Just where I have it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm going to head out okay. now. And let, is there yeah, nothing else I can do? Nothing except the back of my mind. Yeah. Well, you okay. know if I come up with it. Yeah. Oh no, but you know what? So we're hard. actually most of the time on North Campus where oh, the arts okay. are. Okay. So we're back and forth and I'd like to show you the other side so too, the, maybe tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow, yeah, let's so yeah. Yeah, yeah. But just this room for hanging no, out. No, this room day. is fantastic. For hanging out. Yeah. It's my favorite. And you know those boards there, you can move around. So you can reconfigure it, and you can also have them as whiteboards. Oh, these things? Yes. 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 Oh, that's great. Although I have to watch out for that. <laughs> OK, phones on mute, everybody. <laughs> So these events are meant to be social events, but first we want to kind of introduce people who are talking. And it's um, midterm time, so we're quiet. But oh, look at this great group here. Come on in. <laughs> Come on in. Yes, don't be shy. You found it. Yeah, you get a medal. <laughs> It's amazing how many people get lost coming here. I, I Including use Google Maps. And it helped. It yeah, worked. come here completely. Yeah. Come here from New York. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Maru, Brian, and Ivana, Bill, Elika, the family. So. Welcome everybody to our monthly Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. Uh, these are meetings that are meant to get us together to look at ways that people collaborate, uh, share research, and actually create a nice environment for people to not only know each other, but ultimately collaborate. Many great collaborations have emerged since we started doing this about 10 years ago. Uh, when we started, there was maybe three lasers around the world. Now there's almost 60. So the whole field of art and science is just booming so beautifully. I'm really excited about this. And I'm particularly excited about tonight and the following tomorrow. Tonight is like a little flavor of what's to come. Uh, Ten years ago, we hosted the, our first Sound and Science Symposium, and that was super exciting because we really wanted to present uh, vibrations, sound that's audible, inaudible, noise, and just to think about our audio environment in different ways. There's phenomenal things going on in science about it, and in sound art in particular. Um, so the first person that will talk will be B Bill Fontana, which many of you will be familiar with. He's been working for 40 plus years in sound art field, creating amazing um, events in public spaces and museums, and just in general kind of expanding our sense of what we hear and how the hearing and the vibrations affect us in our kind of architectural, public spaces, museums. Um, and without a, a further ado, I will have you just know that tomorrow he's giving a keynote speech where he will really expand on his ideas. Right now he's just giving us a little bit of a preview of whetting your appetite. And uh, luckily those who are streaming can actually hear you talk. Welcome, Bill. No more than 10 minutes, because tomorrow you'll talk. So is my slideshow? That's your slideshow. You just press the arrow forward. Got it? There you go. Um, I um, came up with this name, Harmonic Time Travel, actually for a project I'm doing in Germany right now for the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. 
and that, that's the last thing that's going to be in the slideshow. But I've been uh, really interested in sound as a kind of physical material that em embeds everything in our world, in our environment. Uh, and I've, I've approached it in a couple of ways. Uh, I was interested in how, you know, it, it started calling my work sound sculpture, and I was very interested in the kind of three-dimensional properties of sound and what happens when you uh, create a situation where you can hear the same sound event from multiple distances at the same time. The other, the, and the first, an old project, uh, and the other, the other thing I've worked with uh, a lot is um, how vibrations inhabit uh, structures and materials and how everything you see actually is a list, potential listening device. And I've, the kind of technology I've used in recent times to explore this is a, measure, a vibration sensor that's a measuring instrument called an accelerometer. But way back when, when I started out, uh, when, in the days when I was uh, when I knew John Cage as a student and when it was inspired by what it meant to create music, I, I came up with the idea that the, for me that the act of listening was a way of making music. And and the first uh, uh, sound art pieces I did involved taking objects that had resonant properties and putting them out in an environment with small microphones inside of them. So, so that they were kind of simultaneously, so the object was listening to, in, in, in a musical way to the sounds around it. So way back in 1978, when I was living in Melbourne, Australia, I did an exhibition at a museum called the National Gallery of Victoria. And I did a live uh, multi-channel piece called Sound Sculpture with Resonators, where I had objects in the, in the surroundings of the museum and also in some steel columns in the adjacent Linder Street train station. So, like it sound? I, yeah, that sounds too much. You know what? Will the slideshow make sound? Um, if you have sound. Though. There's sound on it. Hmm? Oh, I'm not hearing the sound. Not, sorry. You don't have sound. Oh, it must be. Uh, it's HDMI, right? It's HDMI, so I have sound be, too. There should be sound. I think we just need the volume. Order and sound preferences to come out interesting. Sometimes it doesn't do it on its own. Go ahead. Should I check it? Yeah. Do it. <laughs> we got tons of sound artists here, so no problem. <laughs> Is there sound on it? Um, yeah, just go to HDMI. Ah, okay. Sync master. Sync master. Oops, wait, wait, wait. Here we go. How many sound artists does it take? <laughs> okay. So we should have. Voila. Voila. Can you turn the volume up a little bit on this? Yes, you can. <laughs> Thank you. So, th so this is a mix of about uh, 10 different resonant objects in downtown Melbourne, Australia in 1978, just re reacting to the ambient sound of of the city, and to me, it was very, very interesting, very, very musical. Uh, and, it, and, and when this was installed as a sound sculpture, it was real time. It wasn't it wasn't recorded. And also in Australia at that time, I had the greatest job in the world. I was uh, working for the Australian Broadcasting uh, Commission, re basically recording what Australia sounded like. So it was a very creative time in my life. Uh, but this idea of how objects, uh, apparently uh, inanimate objects, uh, are alive and, and are actually vibrating all the time in this sort of hidden world of vi vibrations and materials. A very dramatic example of this is in Kyoto, Japan, where I took uh, a, a large type of accelerometer that's uh, called a seismic accelerometer that, ex 
that's extremely sensitive to low energy vibrations uh, and mounted them on the side of a thousand year old Buddhist temple bell in Kyoto. So it's the sound of silence, it's the sound of the bell not ringing. New York City, um, the Met Life Tower, the old Met Life Tower, 23rd Madison Avenue, for 100 years rang Westminster chimes. There's four clock bells on the top of that tower, which was modeled after the Campanile in Venice. When that bu building was sold and, and is currently a luxury hotel, they, they don't ring the clock chimes any longer. But I had the opportunity to go up to that tower and put the same kind of accelerometers I had on the Japanese bell on the four be clock bells of the, the Met Life Tower. And I tried to convince, unsuccessfully so far, an institution in New York to let me do a real-time sound piece with these bells listening to New York. I haven't given up on the idea. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a study for that. One thing I'm trying to do uh, is, you recognize this, is, uh, you know, Big Ben, the fam most famous clock bells in the world, aren't ringing right now mm -hmm. because they're doing renovations to the bell tower. And I, I worked very hard with uh, Radio 3 of the BBC to try to get permission to do a live sound piece about the silence of Big Ben. And the BBC was so interested in the idea that they had, they had this amazing concept that if we could put live sensors on the, on the four bells of, uh, you know, of the Elizabeth Tower, they would do an all night broadcast on Radio 3 wow. with the silence of Big Ben. And I just thought there was something kind of magical for me about these bells listening to the heart of London, <laughs> especially right now. Yeah. <laughs> Brexit. <laughs> Brexit. But, you know, it's, it, it's politically kind of a difficult piece to do, but I'm still tr trying to do this. Now, this picture is of a famous museum in Vienna called the Secession, mm -hmm. and I, I did some re research for a project about that golden dome in the top of it, and I did some accelerometer recordings on the, on the, on the, on the steel dome, and this is what it sounds like with uh, accelerometers mounted on some of these, uh, <coughs> on the backside of some of these golden leaves listening to Vienna. And finally, where the title Harmonic Time Travel comes from. I was in Bonn, Germany in February, uh, working at a place called the Beethoven Foundation, which is situated in the house that Beethoven was born in and grew up in, in Bonn. And there's a room that has these two magnificent late 18th century pianos that Beethoven used to play. And you can see in the picture that they're kind of adjacent to each other, so what I did was on one of the pianos, I put accelerometers on the strings. And on the other piano, I had this wonderful musician who played early Beethoven keyboard music. And I recorded the early Beethoven keyboard music through the other, the vibrations in the strings mm. of, 
of the other piano and made this uh, this this mix. And then in the, when I made the mix, uh, I, in my studio, I fed this recording, uh, accelerometer recording of these strings through a kind of matrix diffusion network I'd set up in my studio so that it, that, that it's, it creates this kind of layered moving mix. You, you're just gonna hear a little bit in stereo, but the real piece is a, a channel piece. Mm. And so I, I called the, the name harmonic uh, time travel comes from this. <coughs> listening to something from the Beautiful. Yeah. So actually next week I'm going back to the Beethoven Foundation, and uh, I'm going to do another recording with this piano, not of uh, listening to the early keyboard music of Beethoven, but to contemporary ambient sounds of Bonn, because somehow that this piano kind of, to me, re somehow represented Beethoven's spirit. Yes. And I and I sort of want to explore how how it is for to listen to the uh, you know contemporary sounds of Bonn. Do you have any questions? We'll do that later. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> last time uh, Bill was here last year, he actually sounded the Sarah sculpture over on the wow. north side. That was really gorgeous. And then I took him over to meet uh, Seth Featherman. Dr. Petterman does audio research, it's incredible. And we went to the anechoic chamber and then the bouncing chamber. And tomorrow they will meet again. So I'm excited to have Dr. Petterman talk tomorrow too. And to introduce Paul Geluso, who's here from New York, just arrived. So it's really late for you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but thank you for being here. Uh, I've worked with Paul in the past. We did the Blue Morph together, and now we're working on Noise Aquarium together. And he's probably one of the big experts in surround sound. So if you want to know anything about surround sound, there's no book there except one that Paul has edited and worked on. So please welcome Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, so my work focuses on the um, capture, uh, playback, and synthesis of multi-channel audio and immersive sound. And uh, uh, as Victoria said, a colleague in mine co-edited a book called Immersive Sound a few years back because um, we found students and practitioners working were having trouble finding, you know, what exactly is wave field synthesis and ambisonics and all these great techniques we have and uh, how do they relate to one another and we put it all under one hood, and uh, so that work uh, led us down this journey to really think about what is immersive sound, and we're now we're working on a second book uh, called uh, Creating the Immersive Sound Experience. The first one was kind of the technology, the second one is actually more of case studies of uh, the work like uh, artists here are doing and so on, we're researching that. So um, yeah, I work at uh, NYU and Harvest Works, they're not the same thing, <laughs> but uh, they are very close in proximity. So uh, I, uh, my background's in electrical engineering and uh, musician, and um, I came to New York and uh, very soon after landed at Harvest Works and met Carol and started working there. And uh, I can, you know, say my life's work is working with artists who work with sound. I'm kind of an enabler and someone like a creative partner. Uh, I like to think of myself as, and uh, 
kind of help help artists realize and also introduce them to new concepts and so on. So that's that's my space where I work. Um, and now I'm teaching uh, full time at NYU. I'm the associate director of the music technology program there. We're doing a lot in 3D audio. So you see Marl on the bottom. That's because uh, NYU Steinhardt. That's our uh, music um, audio research laboratory. We now have an institute where we're researching uh, all sorts of uh, things, um, music information retrieval. Um, we have a co-hire uh, with people over at uh, CompSci and um, uh, working with linguist linguistics and um, people uh, working in, um, I'm forgetting the word, for the brain, uh, <laughs> neuro neuroscience. Yes, we have a new hire that's neuroscience and music technology now, so it's like spreading out like Victoria's work uh, going into the sciences and marrying that with uh, music and so on. So um, tomorrow I'll speak in more depth about the um, kind of the progression of immersive sound and the, the evolution of it. And um, uh, this is the, the main, th when we started writing our book, we had to really think about this. And so we started thinking about immersive sound and then we started to think about, wait a minute, sound coming from a speaker is really much different than acoustic sound. And, and a lot of the tests done on hearing are out of speakers, but they're actually done with real, real life sounds and all this. So we came up with this, this kind of idea that there's, a, there's acoustic space. And um, we have our natural listening, which is just everyday listening. And then we have a, what I'm interested in is virtual auditory space, which is something generated with speakers. Or uh, we include actually acoustics in this if you're in a very live hall or uh, in ancient times people went into caves to hear the echo of their voice and eventually built churches and so on so immersive sound is nothing new um, and then we have media technology where we capture the natural listening space reproduce it throw it back in virtual auditory space but the interesting thing is it lands on the listener experience you know and now with augmented reality we're, we're combining the natural space with the virtual auditory space which I find is very interesting and uh, Bose has these frames. Have any of you, any of you tried these things? They're sunglasses with oh, little. I just saw them. Yeah, they are amazing. Really? Uh, it's it's like it's an experience I've never had before. It's not speakers. It's not headphones. It's something else because um, your ear. I'll, I'll bring them tomorrow. Um, your ear is completely unobstructed, right? So you're hearing amplified sound that's personal. No one else is hearing it, but your regular hearing is still working beautifully. It's. Wow. If, if somebody could do that with vision, that'd be great. Like not having a lens or something in front yeah. of you. I mean, imagine you, if you could just superimpose an image. So it's, it's light years ahead of any, any uh, visual augmented reality. It's fantastic. And I met the Bose people, and I've, I've got the glasses. I, I've got their SDK, and I'm starting <laughs> to work with this stuff now. And so I'll talk about a project uh, Tony, Dove, and I are, are working on at the, at the end of this. So real quick, tomorrow I'll go into more detail, but, you know, Immersive environment starts way back. The, uh, there was a lot of research done that, that areas where there were rituals taking place also have resonance frequencies around 100 hertz, which is the bottom of the male voice. So they're starting to think like, perhaps in ancient times, people went into caves, sang, found the cool spot, and that's where they set up their shop. Um, which would make sense, because later we have other religious spaces with, with similar reverb for singing and amplification and so on. So this is nothing new. But um, the technology came out. Um, this is my favorite recording session. I really wish I was there. And this is the best spot, the cello chair, you know? And, it, it, and you can imagine the take before they couldn't hear the cello. And wait a minute, I got an idea, you know? <laughs> you know, came back with this thing. So this is an early uh, Victor recording session on a, you know, live to disc. And you can see the musicians piled around this thing. And um, Snow, uh, the, the researcher at uh, Early Bell Lab said, um, Mono, uh, a monaural recording is like there's a hole in the wall and there's sound coming out. You know, that's basically where we begin. But this is spacious, though, because you can hear someone's in the front, someone's in the back, someone's on the side, someone's on the left. All the information is here. The thing is, your brain has to figure it out. You know, you can hear there's people in the front. And actually, these old recordings sound better than new recordings because they captured the whole space and the dimension and everything. I love them. These old, these old recordings are fantastic. Um, and here's my recording session. <laughs> we have four player and about 30 microphones. So, you know, we went from this to this, you know. Uh, and this is uh, my class working at NYU, capturing this group with many different perspectives, you know, uh, lower mics, mid mics, you know, binaural head, these sound field 
capture. We, we, this is what we do. We, we, we grab stuff like this. This is my class also capturing the acoustic in a church. We have this oh. spaced array. And later we'll bring the system uh, into surround sound or 3D or into binaural. And we're working on ways to really nail this. So when people put their headphones on, they feel like they're in a church or something like this. So, uh, and this is all um, uh, working with music, very good musicians, very good spaces. So um, Blumline, anybody who knows miking technique knows the Blumline stereo, X, good old XY uh, miking technique. He's really, uh, as I found, the first person who really was thinking about creating a virtual art story space. And he said, a realistic impression um, that the intelligence is being communicated in the same manner as listening to everyday acoustic intercourse. So he was interested very much in speaker systems and virtual environments becoming natural one day, as was Michael Gearson in the 70s and so on. There's been famous scientists who said, no, no, okay, this thing kind of works, but it's not actually, you know, we, we have to go much further. So we have um, speaker-centric systems and headphone-based systems. This is where we're, where we're at today. Tomorrow I'll go into much more detail. But this is very interesting. Headphones and stereo, the image, uh, we do a lot of perceptual studies, sits uh, kind of in your head somewhere. Does everybody notice this one? Put headphones on. You don't really hear sound hitting you on the nose. It's, it's, it's in here, in here, in here. Um, when we add binaural information, it has to do with uh, your ears and your body and catch all these reflections, more spatial information. The sound now sits here and then behind you. But we're still having trouble hitting people on the nose with, with headphones. And, and actually, natural listening is like that. If you listen to me now, most of the sound you hear actually is from here back. But we're so used to listening to TVs and movies and stereos pounding us with sound that we've forgotten actually what natural sound is like. Check this out when you're walking around. See how much sound is really hitting you in the face. It's, it's, it's from here and around. So we discovered when we put tracking on people with, with headphones, all of a sudden, boom, we're in, we're in a very natural environment all of a sudden. Why is that so? In theory, if I just stand there and don't move with headphones on, it should be the same thing. Well, we discovered that if you think about it, when you turn around, now you have 360 immersion because normal headphone listening sits in here. But with the headset that moves, when you turn around, you know, you have these different sound images. And now you can draw a picture because that's kind of what we do in real life, I think. I think we, we, we turn our head a few times and go, uh-huh, I'm in a church, I'm in a hall, I'm in a cave, I got it. Now I know where I am. Without that interaction, um, which we do have with speakers, actually, because when you're listening to speakers, you can't turn your head and all this. And uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Seth Kluid, up at, uh, he's up at Columbia now, said, yeah, actually, when a guy's playing a trumpet, you know, he's moving like this, you know, it's not, and a mic doesn't, may not get that, you know, and there's this, all the subtlety. So this is uh, my work now is trying to really capture sound in a way that can be reproduced very naturally. Um, and we've already discovered head tracking is great. And by the way, head tracking is going to be in every new pair of Bluetooth headphones. Um, uh, Bose has had it in its headphones and not told anybody. <laughs> a lot of their older models have head tracking that there's just nothing to turn on. And Sony as well. And uh, it's, it's in most, most probably, you know, if you go out and buy a good pair of headphones today, they, they have the head tracker waiting to be hooked up. Um, so it's very interesting. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to tell artists to, you know, let's, let's make some great work using this technology because it's, it's here. Um, so designing the immersive sound experience, we have envelopment, which is um, when you're immersed and not questioning where the sound is. This is like reverb or, you know, I hear sound all around me, but I'm not, I'm not looking to see where it's coming from. Directional sounds, you know, you can hear points. Movement of sounds, um, uh, nonlinear, uh, nonlinear narrative. This is where you know you have six degrees of freedom and you can walk around. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Distributed performance, which we enjoyed a lovely one earlier today with people in different spaces, and augmented environments. These are kind of the you know this is kind of my menu when I'm working with somebody. Okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> how would you like to work, right, 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 Victoria? Right. My first question is is what? It's where's this going? Like when someone walks into the studio, I ask them, you know, how is this going to be played back? Because that will change. Uh, how we're working completely. So these are kind of the, the tricks up our sleeve, we'll say. So we've always had scene-based audio. This is where you have a fixed stereo recording. And um, that stereo, can, you can think of bringing the musicians kind of um, in your house. So you have stereo, and it's kind of like 
oh, there's the band, they're sitting there. But you're not, you're not in the band. You're, the band's there and, and you're here. And once you get into immersive systems, binaural and so on, you can actually put yourself into the action. And to do that even better, we're working with object-based audio, which means that the, the audio exists as an object in a 3D space. It does, it's not mixed into anything. So the relationship to all the sounds change as you change your position. So if there's two people talking and I move over here, now the relationship is com completely changing. Where if I have mixed them down and put them into surround sound, they're, they're stuck in relationship to each other in those speakers. So what can we do with object-based audio? Well, Dolby is flying sounds over your head and doing all sorts of great stuff in the theaters because the way the films are mixed now is they have beds and then they have things that fly around and based on the, the, the speaker location, each theater will fly around a little bit differently. If you have 100 speakers, it goes through 100 speakers. If I got three speakers, it'll go through three speakers. And, and this is new, uh, all falls under this object base. But, um, but what I wanted to do with, with, uh, with my, uh, my project that uh, was funded through, through Harvest Works, Carol will talk a bit more about, is I created this box I call 3D Sound Object. And what this is, is a six, six driver speaker and using um, uh, ambisonics, if you're familiar with that, that's a, a 3D miking technique reversed because the speaker is a microphone. I can beam sound in different directions. And also I built it for electronic musicians to synthesize new complex spatial instruments uh, inspired by the cello, let's say. When you walk around a cello, um, well, let's say the cello is over by the chair and I say, mm, there's a cello there, right? And as you walk closer, you start to hear, oh, wait a minute, there's the string sound, left sounds different than the right. You get a little bit closer, oh, now there's a bow. And as you get closer to the sound, it starts to parse out, right? And if you record something with one microphone, one speaker, that never happens. You get closer to the speaker, it sounds identical. And this is what's wrong with a lot of the virtual experiences, is as you approach things, they just get louder, and that's, that's not working. It just sounds like somebody turned up the volume. So with this speaker, this is for live performance. I wanted to have a multi, multi-directional timbre, timbrely, uh, uh, someone able to produce a multi-directional timbre as cool as a cello for electronic music. And so also cool things happen is if we run, say, sine waves out of these in air harmonics or, or that don't exist are built. So I'm very much interested also in composing in air. And I did a, a project with Suzanne Tharp where we put four speakers together and just ran sine waves and created some crazy stuff in the air because that's you know that's the way an instrument's working it's vibrating like crazy and in air interesting things happen which gives it a very complex uh, radiation so anyway that's that's where i'm going with all this is trying to create better better sounding objects for for virtual uh, auditory environments and for performance so here's three sound object in a the church is the first run of it, and um, this is a performance we did at NYU with electronic music, and it was fantastic because the instead of having the speakers far away and the whole hall being reverbed, people got a very nice direct signal, and then the reverb came much later. You know, typically in a concert, the speakers would be here and here, and by the time you hear the speaker, you're also hearing the floor and the walls where this has a straight shot to everybody. So the the room sounded quite dry. Actually, it's it very nice. Um, one other project. How am I doing on time? You're over. I'm over? Oh, it's okay. I'll pick this up tomorrow. The last one. Okay, so this is uh, Tony Dove's uh, The Dress That Eats Souls, um, Tony's latest work. And um, this was a, I uh, used some interesting technology here. Just go through it real quick. Um, so we used stereo speakers with uh, crosstalk cancellation, which uh, gives you binaural sound over speakers. So basically, you can have a binaural. Like headphones, you can do this over speakers with a very sophisticated crosstalk, uh, which uh, Edgar Chouari from uh, Princeton is working on, this box system. So this was great because the, the person was just standing there like this. Then we had a robotic uh, speaker for the dress to talk, which emulated uh, someone moving, sound object. And then we had another speaker um, right in the cone of confusion, which is an area where you don't know where sound is coming from. It's, it's over your head about here. It just so happens that sound coming from here sounds like sound coming from many directions. So there's this spot that, that really sounds like a sound is in your head. And we found the spot just by, you know, <laughs> moving the speaker around. So this speaker would come on and feel like somebody was in your head talking to you. And so we had like different dimensions. 
which basically I was trying to construct a, a natural sound field, you know, where, where there's different sound objects in the room. Uh, so um, um, this is a project I saw last night over at Dolby Labs. Uh, what they did was this company, Transverse FM, this is an app you can buy, took this Elvis recording session and then mapped it into an app with uh, headphones. So, so you walk along and this thing tracks the floor. The camera needs to be on the floor, so it knows where you are. And you, you walk up to Elvis and then you turn around <laughs> and you walk over to the drums and it's cool, you know? It's like you're in the studio and, you know, people are walking around uh, you know, with the phone. Um, uh, and they have one of Yo-Yo Ma that's supposed to be wonderful. And so what, what they're doing is they're taking old vintage recordings, treating these as objects, right? Because they are kind of sound objects. And, and by the way, these are ribbon eight, uh, figure of eight microphones. So they're actually, we're picking up phase information. It's, it's, it's no, it's, it's, um, cardioids wouldn't have done as good a job. So uh, anyway, that's the state of the art there. But tomorrow I'm going to go into much more detail. Awesome. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I, sure. I actually just for the first time, oops, we get to see yourself. For the first time, I experienced Tony Dove's um, the dress that dress eats that souls. Eats souls. souls. <laughs> yes, really, really amazing work, actually. Um, so today we had such a wonderful event here with Ken Fields, mm -hmm. and Ken and I go way back. I have to say, mm -hmm. UCSB. He was doing a PhD, oh, and I was on the committee. Um, First time ever connecting art, engineering, and music. And very soon after he graduated, he went off to China, was there for 20 years, got married, had kids, and kid, and um, about 10 years ago started working on ArtSmash, a, pro a project to connect uh, people from around the world to compose, so network composition, which is what we experience today with a student of his in UC Santa Barbara. And we had Gil Kuno, who's actually a design media arts alumni at Harvestworks. And Joel Ung, who I also worked with, who was in Canada. And it was just so seamless that all of us who remember the 90s were going, oh my god, it finally can happen. So welcome, Ken. Okay, something about myself. So I was at UCSB in the 90s making a multimedia art and technology degree. I was in cognitive science also with Jack Loomis. Mm -hmm. So I did a VR, oh, right. a VR immersive dissertation. Um, <clears throat> um, then I spent 20 years at Central Conservatory of Music, but in that time I was also five years in Canada as a research chair. I started developing network music because video in Canada, and I just wired them together. Um, CanaryNet is the Canada Research Network, like Internet too, and China has the China Education Research Network. And China is only an IPv6 network on their research network. Uh, they don't have IPv4, so I had to get CanaryNet to support IPv6, and that was in 2008. Um, so we started in, in Alberta and Calgary, and then basically the other cities then all got IPv6. So my two studios were in constant interaction and had students in both places, and they were playing together. And so we started building out prototypes, but I developed it more in uh, Beijing on commercially. So I had a, a funder, luckily, who came along and put a million dollars into it. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, latest work was, this book came out this year as a over, it's an overall thing of the last maybe 20 years of network music, starting with Internet 2. Um, I wrote a chapter with Simon Emerson called Extended Music Practice on the Internet. So you can get a general overview with that. And this one is coming out in the summer. 
this is the other half of me is basically this is the development of electronic music in Asia, East Asia. So it's in an organization called MSAN, Electronic Music Studies Asian Network, was related to EMS. Um, and then through that, we've um, combined a little network music with that by doing an all Asian concert, which is in the same time zone which is nice. So we had uh, Japan and Korea and Taiwan, Beijing and Malaysia, Sydney, and Singapore. So we all did a nice concert together. Usually we're all dispersed over many different time zones. So it's somebody's drinking coffee and somebody else is doing sleeping pills. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this will be coming out as a Rutledge special issue as books edition. Here's some of the, the chapters covering uh, like the electronic music conferences that evolved in Japan and Korea and we especially did the music, uh, music Acoustica Beijing Festival for the last 15 years and that was, that attracted a lot of people. It was sort of peaked around 20, 2010 through 2012, but it's still going. This is the Arts Mesh, which is a very complex task space. So we used to just put, um, you know, 10 or, 10 or so different applications together, one doing audio, one doing video, one doing OSC, open sound control, chat programs. Um, you know, what else do we have in there? Graphic scores. Um, anyway, we had to find a, a solution for that, so putting everything under the hood. Basically, you, you make a profile for your, your user and your group and your project and it has an IP address so that you don't have to type in long IP addresses to, to reach your peers and um, especially long IPv6 addresses. This is um, on the bottom is a router. It's a very elegant space to route audio in. So it's multi-channel. Um, you can specify how many channels you want to connect between different cities. Um, our metronome determines delay between the cities. So you can determine a beat per minute and so you can synchronize on a, on a pulse so you can play together. Um, there's audio mixers and video mixers and inter-application stuff happening because you still use your pro applications of video and audio but those have to be piped into Arts Mesh, and then Arts Mesh does the networking. Anyway, um, I guess this is the, the structure that sort of um, inspires me these days. This comes from the internal workings of an ancient hmm. clock <laughs> planetary, <laughs> planetary thing that tracks the eclipses <coughs> and the, the planetary movement they found in the in the Greek isles or submerged in the ocean from about 2,000 years ago. Um, so intricate um, connection of all these different uh, lengths of loops. Mm -hmm. And this is what I envision for the, the global loop orchestra. <laughs> No, we haven't even come close. I mean, we attempted today another one between Toronto and New York and, and then UCLA, UCSB, which are three milliseconds together, and New York and UCLA, which are about, what, was about 80 milliseconds together. Um, but I envision someday that we, um, we work like clockwork. <laughs> <laughs> But it takes discipline because two cities are complex. But if you put all these different loops together, there's going to be all these polyrhythmic um, resonations happening. So, like resonant objects, and uh, I, I think cities are resonant. You know, 
LA and New York have a special resonance and they will always have that because of the speed of light and the, the distance between them. And Beijing and, and Singapore, they have their own resonance. You know? And so I think um, as we move from these spaces that you saw in your caves, mm -hmm. in your cathedrals, and these modern auditoria, now we have this huge network as our, as our um, sounding space. And uh, as we get better with it and more mm, facile with it, then I think we'll, we'll be hearing more masterpieces and intricate designs, you know, as people compose for all these different vectors. Like you can go from LA to Miami, and then Miami can shoot it out to four different places. So you can have like a little star system, and then each can do some processing and send it send it all back to San Francisco. So there's, you have control over the network routing that you send the, uh, the signals to. And in addition to that, I threw this one in because UCSB, when I was thinking up a art and technology degree and Victoria was there to help <laughs> cognize it, um, that was art and technology. Yeah. We've done that. We've done that. So now it's 20 years later, 30, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm thinking of something else, which is more um, not because art and technology and science are, are assumed. They're built into the music department or the art department. Now we don't have to do a special create lab or an eat lab or a sleep lab or <laughs> something. So what's next, I think, is um, sound and wisdom in wisdom. So I've had enough of art and science. <laughs> we can put that in over there. And we just do that. We don't have to think about it. But now I would like to focus on sound that matters. The material, spiritual aspect of sound. So I'm trying to create a PhD program now in phonosophy. It's a network program. And uh, we can, you know, students could put networked ensembles together, or we can interact with student and teacher playing music together. Um, but in the end, it should be sound that matters, mm -hmm. does some good. Sounds, and sounds, uh, we have this word, eudo eudaimonia, mm -hmm. in the Greek language, which is um, the good. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> 20 years? <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> so, Carol, we're going to pull your computer out. And Carol has a few videos, so we're going to do this easier way. Just hook it up. Got to do the sound thing. Yes. Ah, uh, the HDMI. Do they see this? Do they see this? I don't know why they don't see it here. Okay. Why is it not in both? Uh, probably. Well, I think we're just going to well, see That's fine. Do you want to check the sound? Yeah, that's on the HDMI. Should be seen. Oh, yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay. But what about the sound? Oh, we have to get out of there. We have to, it has to be in the. We have got to check the preferences. How <laughs> you see that? All right, so. 
Remember, the preferences have to be set to whatever that is. Sound preferences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know well. Yeah, yeah. Goodness, is it showing? Yeah, so it's going to the display yeah. port. Okay, so it should be good. It's better sound field. It's four. It's four. Yeah, just four. Yeah, but it's. You know, it sounds really good when you don't decode it. Like if you use it, just send it to those two words. Okay, we go. The master of it. Hi, I'm Carol Parkinson. Oh. <laughs> Let me introduce you briefly. So, just uh, we're gonna have time to chat. So, uh, Carol Parkinson is also here from New York. Also arrived well last night, but it's pretty late for her. Uh, so, Carol directs the probably last nonprofit center that's dedicated to sound art, Harvest Works. And whoops, we don't want it to move this. Um, and whoa, well, what is going on? <laughs> and, okay, here we go. We're gonna just escape until I'm done. <laughs> what is it on like a? I don't know. I'm not a PowerPoint expert myself. Okay. Anybody knows so it doesn't oh, oh, start. It's okay. Well, just so it doesn't start like screaming. Anyway, I'll just continue by saying that um, talk about an enabler I mean Carol has enabled some phenomenal work over the years and I am so grateful for you to come and to us tomorrow especially give a kind of a longer talk about all the amazing projects that were particularly experimental that would never have the support or the kind of uh, and I'm not talking about financial support, I'm talking about like support to make it happen. Yeah. So please welcome Carol Parkinson. It's true, we're probably one of the last <laughs> surviving um, nonprofit community based arts organizations um, that. Um, are artists run? Artists run organizations were very popular in in the early early 80s. They were a, a refuge for young artists who were ignored by museums and gallery um, in the arts industry. So um, we would group together and make our own organizations and run the or, uh, and run the organization. Uh, and this is, you know, I wanted to thank Victoria for inviting me to come and talk about Harvest Works, um, especially at this Sound and Science Symposium. And uh, here's a, and what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about our history and the people and some projects that we've done. This is just like a little snapshot of what what uh, the organization has done over the years. We were founded as an, as I said, an artist-run organization in 1977. And originally, um, the, the founders were sound artists, builders of electronic uh, instruments and um, uh, synthesizers. So, but, but they always had the goal of um, allowing these uh, instruments who, that were housed primarily in academic institutions to bring those, uh, that new music to the public. So um, the founder, Greg Kramer, built those booklets that you see there in the picture. Uh, the, the original uh, uh, teacher was um, um, Gerald Lindahl, and here's a picture of him teaching, you know, the community about, about sound art and how to run the analog synthesizers. There was also trips to Washington Market, uh, Washington Square Park, where uh, Greg would set up his synthesizers and there would be an ensemble playing. Now here we are now, and our neighborhood is quite different, but our mission stays the same. You know, we support contemporary artists in the creation of artworks now achieved through new and evolving technologies. Although sound is still our passion, as you have heard from, from uh, Paul, who is our uh, studio director. So the, these projects, I'm going to quickly go through them. Um, the, this is the technology, uh, the creativity plus technology equals enterprise.
program. It was a three-year project that was started in 2012 with a grant from the Regional Economic Development Council of New York and Rockefeller uh, Foundation's Cultural Innovation Fund. Uh, the goal was to, uh, was designed to create a bridge between um, new, uh, new, new widgets, new technology that was being um, created by the artists at Harvest Works through uh, our education program and, and um, to, and, and to bring, to investigate bringing those projects to the public. So uh, one of the successful projects was the Marco Donnarumma and Heidi Bover project called Radical Signs of Life. And this was a project where uh, music was generated from the dancers' muscles and blood flow via biophysical sensors that captured sound waves and triggered complex neural patterns. Per and this was an art piece that was projected on multiple screens as 3D imagery. They, now their widget was called uh, the X biosensor. And if I could find my, if I could find my, what do you mean? Uh, my mouse? cursor. Oh, yeah. I see it. Man, it's way over there. Oh, because. Very small. Oh, yes. Okay, Your here we go. Like so, so I'm going to try and play <laughs> so this. Fly. Oh, wow. Play this uh, link here. Let's see what happens. <laughs> here I go. But I'm not seeing the video. No. This is Marco Donnarumma in performance with his widget, which is the X Sense. And unfortunately, you can't see him perform. Is there any way I can get my screen over there? Okay. Marco Donnarumma and Heidi Bovert. Now, another team that participated in the program was the Matthew Ostrowski and Luc Dubois team. They had a project called 1973, which uh, the technology was audio sonification and data visualization. Um, and the ensemble, the ensemble um, used uh, cutting edge data mining and interactive performance technology to bring the cultural representations of the year 1973 to the stage. Uh, that, uh, that, had, that project has yet to see a performance, but uh, we're still working on it. Here's a um, piece by Arthur Elsnar. It's called Interfacial T Tendencies. And his work is focused <laughs> on the, the system of computer control of the human face. Facial muscles and expressions of the human face are choreographed and manipulated by means of external control. And, and you know, the, you have, what you have to like realize is that these are all individual artists working in the field on their stuff. And we raise funds for them to come in and create a new work and to share that work with the community. I have, I have this video also. Um, how we play it again? Maybe try to escape and go out of key, keynote, and then. Uh, oh, it's. Maybe your other screen will. Okay, now just hit the video. The thing is, her screen is so small. Oh yeah. Now and I have to go back. Full screen when you when you start to play it. I think I'm gonna work on it until. All right. Let's see. There you are over there. Oh, yes. Good. Slide. Slide. Are you in 
working it out. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Okay, here's Arthur. Uh, so there, the, I mean, all these videos are on our website, and I tried to pull them in through a URL on, into these slides, but I think there's still some issues with, with, the, with the viewing of that. Um, this project, uh, as Paul said, uh, was Paul Geluso. He uh, created the uh, 3D sound object, and it was this, you, you heard the technical information about this piece. Um, but it was tested and shown to the public um, by sound artists Suzanne Thorpe, also Stephen Vitiello and Steve Roden uh, did a work for it for the 2013 New York Electronic Art Festival in St. Cornelius Chapel on Governor's Island. Uh, Paul, as you know, is an engineer, composer, and musician and educator. Wish I could play this. I'm going to try to play it. You know, we can it's listen to we'll it. Oh, it's so tomorrow. awesome. Oh, you. oh. You're just going to hear it because the video won't be shown. This is called Flock. I program in Max, um, but for this particular one, it was more fluid to work with Ableton, with the Ableton and Max hybrid. throwing the sound is people will be hearing of reflections of the sound, not necessarily the sound directly all the time. So it will be a, a, the way that the piece is diffused, it will create a sensorium that I don't think I was, would be able to create otherwise. you may have suspected that's uh, the work was composed to evoke a sensorial experience of a flock of birds taking off. Perfect. There it is. Okay. So this piece, the next piece I'm going to show is uh, by Lovid, <clears throat> which is a collaborative duo of Tali Hinkis and Kyle Lapidus. They were working with Sean Montgomery on this project called Telephone Rewired. And the Telephone Rewired project uh, it was an audiovisual installation that probes and modulates human consciousness by rhythmically modulating neural oscillations in the brain to impact cognition. So how they did that is they built a room, that, uh, a white room with ultraviolet lights, 
and uh, the viewers donned an EEG monitor where there, and when they entered the room, they heard various sounds and their brain rhythm synchronized into a neurofeedback loop. And, and they entered the era of, I like that word, augmented cognition. <laughs> So that was pretty cool. cool. I never went in there. I, was, uh, I wasn't going to go to the augmented con cognition stage. But there were plenty of people who did. So. Okay, and the, the last, uh, this piece is by Jeff, Jess Rowland. Uh, she created uh, flexible audio arrays with flat conductors, conductive circuits in copper and aluminum foils. Um, the electromagnetic field and the interaction with the stationary magnet generated the sound and the, and the surfaces that she created uh, maximized the relationship between the magnet and the circuit design which offered an optimal audio level. So that's how we got to hear it. Uh, she did a great piece in the New York Electronic Art Festival. Okay, then so we also do presentations and that's how we get the work out to the public. So we help the artists uh, we, we choose the work, we help the artists produce the work, and then we get it out to the public. And this is, and that's where we worked with Victoria for a, a couple of great projects. Uh, this was the Blue Morph. And as you see, this is the St. Cornelius Chapel, which was um, an amazing space to work in, 30-foot ceilings, and um, there was a nave behind here, but Victoria used it as a projection surface. Uh, and then you might recognize the uh, octagonal pad that, you, that she has in the new work. That was one of the early versions, so when you sat on the octagonal pad, then you could control the sound and visual images. So that was in 2011. Uh, and then we also worked with her for the Birdsong Diamond uh, which was created with evolutionary biologist Charles Taylor physicist Takahishi Ekigami and the UCL ArtSci Collective. The ArtSci Collective was just like so extraordinary. Uh, in this piece, you know, we, in, they installed 24 parametric speakers to pump bird song, cave bird song, because we were in a cave, uh, through the speaker system through, to the audience. So when you walked around the space, you could actually hear the cave bird and, and the sensation was that it was right in your ear. And that was one of the really nice parametric uses of parametric speakers that I, I can imagine. Uh, and th then we also uh, produced a performance in Times Square. So there was an opportunity for us to take some of the elements uh, this uh, hyperbolic dish take some of the elements up to Times Square and introduce the uh, audience to the piece at Times Square. So this, I'm going to wrap it up now. We're, we're uh, um, about to launch or produce the 2019 New York Electronic Art Festival and it will be in Nolan Park on Governor's Island. Uh, the opening concert is May 24th and the, um, the exhibition opens June 1st and it closes August 11th. So if you're in New York, you should come and visit us. We have some great work out there. We've got great, uh, great performances in July with Natasha Deals. I don't know if you know, if you guys know Natasha. She's, she's uh, a West Coast uh, composer. Uh, so we'll be doing some work with her on the island this summer. So uh, this is the end. We're driven by sound originally. <laughs> We've expanded, and but again, uh, the passion is still the sound art. Thank you. Thank we'll see you tomorrow. You. Thank you, Carol, for right. oh, doing nice. such amazing work. Really, I would say the whole field owes you this is a big the thank tip. you. Absolutely, this is the tip. I have I thought of a text document. I could talk for three hours, but especially. <laughs> So that's, we can talk a little bit now and just relax, so we're not going to have any lectures or anything like that anymore, but this is a, also a little bit of a taste for tomorrow. 
where we have an incredible group of people in addition to the ones you heard tonight. And all sound artists have to also present with sound. So it will be quite interesting. There's going to be a couple of performances. And I really hope that you come along, or if those of you are watching, come. Uh, we'll be streaming as well. So everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.